gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you somebody who perhaps needs no introduction to any true Newfoundlander. Let's welcome Jeremy Squire. <laughs> Jerry is joined tonight by his wife Gail. A very special word of welcome to you, Gail. Thank you for your support. And as well, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Margie Jensen. Margie Jensen is the lady here in the parish, she's standing by Jerry right now, who is responsible for the booklet that you have in your hands. If you haven't been here two centuries as before, or if you uh, haven't really had the opportunity to study some of the features that are highlighted in this booklet, we encourage you to stay behind after the presentation tonight, and at any time, of course, feel free to walk around the church and appreciate the uh, art and the uh, paintings that we do have here at St. Teresa's. I'd ask you respectfully now, as Jerry begins, to reach into your purse or your pocket and silence your cell phones, please. Jerry. Can you hear me? Yes, I don't know where to start. Not very loud. Not very loud. Louder? Okay, now? Can you hear me? Back there? Can you hear me back there? Good. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'd like to thank Father uh, English for inviting me to be here. I love this church very much. And it's uh, been a, and I recently just discovered this church actually. And I, uh, for some reason or another, I never paid any attention or anybody told me about this place. And I knew the architect. Uh, I knew him when he was a uh, young sculptor. And, uh, he, uh, he had a studio just outside of Toronto where I was living at the time, and my uh, instructor, Mr. Dan Logan, told me that he was doing something about Newfoundland. So, would you like to see what he's done? And I, I saw it, I said, absolutely. And uh, I went out to meet him, and they, they, he was, he's 10 years, 10 years older than I was, but he was already established as a, as a sculptor in Toronto, and uh, this is one of his uh, favorite uh, commissions. But he was a, 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 an architect, a sculptor, a painter, he was a Renaissance man, you might say. And uh, so we got along quite well, and uh, he loved him from that, and he the trips that he made down here. And uh, he was working on that big painting here at the uh, prayer room. Uh, when I was in the studio, we were just starting to work on it. It's called, uh, and I call it the Newfoundland Madonna. Uh, but he, uh, he called, I think, the area of Newfoundland was beautiful even then when he did, but now it's been clean and so on and so forth. Now that was like 40 years ago, and then I met him 50 years ago. And, but, uh, but I really appreciate what he's done here. And then, when Father Henry uh, showed me around, I was totally amazed at the beautiful works of art. We were very lucky to have it to And uh, so when I came back to Newfoundland, I discovered this, and then I, uh, I had my own church to do. So I, I did it when I went to the Mary Queen of the World, and like some of you might have seen it. And, uh, uh, but it was mostly, my work was mostly paintings. Uh, in there and uh, and some stained glass windows that uh, and, uh, back were helping with when we uh, very free the world and uh, not only did he design this place and, and uh, but he did all the sculptures and uh, and, uh, and wherever you look you'll see a bit of uh, of what he was a he was a good man but I'm here for another reason. I think that uh, we've been talking about sacred spaces. 
I think it's very important to me as a, as a painter. And uh, I, I, I want to go through uh, some slides that I thought I'd, I'd bring along with me to show you where those sacred, sacred places are. But you just think about it for a second. When you look at a painting in a gallery, or in a, some private home. What are you seeing that painting with? That's the question. Um, we obviously with the eye, you say it's with the eye, but it's not. There's other spaces inside the human being that he, he's sensitive to. And it's nothing to do with flesh and bone. It's to do with the spirit. And uh, so you uh, so you're, uh, become aware the reason that that painting touched you uh, uh, is, is for that very reason. It's not, not for any uh, trick on the, the part of the artist or anything else, but it's something that's within the viewer that uh, allows that communication to happen. And uh, as I was say, uh, as in, just to explain a little story, uh, when I was uh, young art student, uh, I went to New York City uh, to copy things at the Metropolitan Museum. I was about 18, I guess. And at that time, you could go into the, the major galleries and uh, bring your equipment, and you could you could copy whatever things you wanted. Or you could supply a drop sheet for you so you wouldn't make a mess. So I was in New York for about uh, over a month. And I was copying say something said in I think I copied them all, I don't know where they are today. But uh, I like and the reason Cezanne, just as an example, uh, the reason uh, for Cezanne was that I was having the same problem that Cezanne had had when he was young to do with color. I had a real problem with color. And and my friend told me, he said, but if you want to learn about color, go to the man who really study color on his own, not through any other uh, interpretation at all, and that was say so. So I uh, went there for that purpose. But while I was there, uh, I was walking through the museum one day, and, and I was tired, and I was walking to them, just turned the corner, and there was this little Rembrandt thing about this subject. And uh, I looked at it for a long time, and, I, and I, I actually physically got to my knees. And I realized that this that manipulation of pain can create within the soul of a man a response. And, uh, and for that reason, I, I, it was like an epiphany for me, because I, I was having a lot of trouble with my paintings and so on. But when I saw that, a light came into my head that I knew that Rembrandt had me wrong. <laughs> so I, so I, uh, uh, I thought, Why? what a... But then I realized that I'm going to have to spend the rest of my life now, because I got this little insight into what art is. I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to figure it out. So that's what I thought with my life. And I, and I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to show a few uh, things uh, what happened there. Where's my technician? <laughs> okay. Uh, that, that person, no, it's okay now. It's okay. I, I think this uh, has a mind of its own, doesn't it? Uh, I went to Mexico in the 1950s, the early 50s. And, uh, and, the, the, and I stayed in Tasco, uh, Mexico. And there's a cathedral there called the Santa Cristia Cathedral. And that's it there. That's the one color I made. I was about 18 when I did this. And uh, it, 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 it was a sacred place for sure because I, I went there every day to, just to sit in the, in the cathedral itself and just watch the people come and go in and so on. And uh, my studio was not too far from this church, so I would be, of course, painting during the day. 
and then my secret place would be in the cool of that cathedral. So that is a way it's a, a this one, uh, is that a, is that a, uh, <coughs> this painting is a, the first si uh, series I started of the uh, of the Stations of the Cross. I just thought I'd bring this to uh, show you. And it was while I was living in Toronto, and that's the old city hall there. And the new city hall, of course, it, it was over there where the those old houses are in, in the Toronto. And you might see, you might see the influence of, uh, of Stanley Spencer there, the English painter. But uh, there is some influence there, I must say. But it's the first presentation. I was going to do 14 drawings to size and have them shown to the people at City Hall and then take them around the streets of Toronto. But uh, uh, that was the only one I did. Um, I started a, a, a group of paintings called St. Francis of Assisi. And I did some uh, 30 paintings, I guess, paintings and drawings, St. Francis. And uh, this is one of the ones that's, that I think, I, I think the room's on set now. But all the other ones are up in the mainland somewhere. And uh, I read, the, uh, I started to read uh, Kazanzaki's uh, novel called Francis. And it's, it struck me as such an uh, extraordinary uh, story that I did all these paintings. Uh, I'm mean, very influenced by literature, by the way, and a lot of the uh, inspiration comes from the things I read and, and uh, other than just what I see. And uh, this was one of the biggest uh, St. Francis coins as well. And, uh, and that, I believe that one's here at, at the rooms as well. And it's a, it's a pen and ink drawing and a wash drawing. It's not a lithograph. Although it has a lithograph shape to it, it's not a lithograph. <coughs> And then I started a, a series of paintings uh, called the Wander Paintings. And before I uh, before I uh, came back to Newfoundland to stay, and uh, they were uh, I did some forty of them, and uh, and they were all stark figures like this on a, on a background, on a uh, harsh background. And uh, they were sort of abstracted figures, so I'll just go through those a little bit. And uh, you can see them. But this is what I was doing when I was away. So maybe I'm not influenced by Newfoundland. <laughs> best choice I ever made. This is one girl, that's what part of that. This is. Uh, this is a series of, uh, another series I started when I when I came back to Newfoundland in the 1960s. The first place I went was Exploits Island, where I was uh, spent my childhood, and uh, I was looking for a place uh, of warmth and and kindredship and uh, love that I felt when I lived on Exploits when I was a boy. But when I returned. The whole place was falling apart. The bay was emptying of people. There were uh, household uh, uh, things out on the beach and abandoned houses. And, and uh, it was a terrible, a terrible time for Newfoundlanders. Uh, most people here remember uh, the resettlement programs of the Joyce Mullen government, and, uh, which was a great tragedy. In my, in, but I'm sure when it comes to the financial aspect of it, uh, that may be all right. But from the point of view of, uh, of, the, of your soul and your heart and your love, it was a great tragedy. But I think we got over it. I'm not quite sure, but I think we did. But, uh, I did a, uh, so I did a series of paintings based on, 
on that, but also about my own uh, upbringing in, uh, in, around the Bay in the 1940s uh, and 50s. 40s. Sorry. Another one here, that's one of the Boatman paintings as well. The Boatman plays a major um, part, the figure actually in the Boatman in, the, in his boat. And uh, uh, in my penis, uh, star starstruck in a room, I think it's called. But it's, all those titles come from Dylan Thomas's but poetry. So, this is the way that you know, I spent 14 years. And that's me up there, by the way, in the foreground. And that's me in the bag. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Fiddle player at the back there, you can see that. And there's my grandmother standing beside that sculpture that I made that she never saw. And, uh, when I was making this, um, the bag came last, actually, in this painting. The uh, figure was there floating in space. But I, I was at the grocery store and I picked up the bag, and it looked so beautiful to me. I had to paint it in the, into the picture. That's what I did. So is that, that's the kind of thing I'm trying to say, that those spaces in your mind are your sacred places where you go to, to uh, find inspiration and, uh, and uh, well, there's very stormy sky out there. But I, you know, all the time I lived in the lighthouse, I, I did very few paintings of the house itself. It was only after I left that I went back to paint the White House. And I, I brought some of those to show you. This, is, well, this one here, uh, I think this one is at the uh, looms at the moment. Did anybody see this there at the looms, did you? Now, I was going to, when I was painting this, I was going to my mother's album. And uh, up at the top here, you see these people, they're all related to me. And they're full wild people. Haynes from Full Wild. And that's my mother in a white dress at the very end. She was seven years old when a photograph was taken. And my uncles and my grandmother and great grandmother. And my aunt Annie, which is a baby here. And the the uh, photograph was most interesting because uh, there was a blanket thrown over the side of the house so to disguise the house. They didn't want to see the old house in the, in the picture. But just on the corner of it, a little bit of the clapboard got in into the picture. So interesting. It was very interesting. The people in those days never thought of the way we think about old houses today. Uh, they were ashamed of it in most cases because they were old and forgotten. And Trying to tear it down and build a new. Uh, Newfoundlanders were not about trying to save things. They never saved things. They uh, would use it until it was no longer useful, and then they would go on. And uh, so, and, and then the other religious symbols here, with the crucifixion, and this figure floating up here, and here are sort of what I call. Body parts. If you look at the painting, you know, when you go up to the Arts and Culture Center, there's a self portrait right there. You have a look at Okay, this is a triptych. Uh, and I don't have the picture of them all together, so I'll just go through them and I'll tell you a little bit about them. That's the center panel there, and uh, that was the first panel, and that's the second panel, and that's the third panel here. Now, it's a large painting, and it was at Rose for quite some time, did the way on, on their staircase uh, But I, uh, I painted it mainly, uh, I, it was kind of a resurrection for me, uh, resurrection of of thought and ideas. And 
And I, I, I've got to make criticize, I'll tell you this, I've got to make criticize about this particular one. Well, it wasn't a criticism, just a statement that they, they, they look at it this way, that this is the male bird, and these are the females. And uh, they're, they're dominating the males, dominating the females. But that wasn't my intention. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's quite different, uh, quite a different view of the But they're made up, of, you can see that the bird is made up of stone and feathers and, uh, and bone. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I just want to show you some of these. Uh, these are the paintings that I have at Mary Queen of the World. Some of you have seen these. And these are the stations. And uh, I was commissioned, uh, well, I think it was 1983, I think, to, uh, to paint uh, the stations of the cross, uh, resurrection, uh, and uh, the crucifixion. And the Last Supper for this for Mary Queen of World Church, and uh, it took me three and a half years to, uh, to complete it. And the stations, uh, I set the stations up. The stations were two feet by three feet, and, uh, and I set them up in my studio so I could so I could work them so I could do my stations uh, every day. So I would. Instead of just painting one and putting it aside, I did all 14 of them at the same time. So I had to move around because I wanted to keep it. It all happened in such a short period of time that I wanted to. Uh, but I, but also I, I did away with all the Roman soldiers and uh, and the angry Jews and and so on and uh, left it to a man alone in the, in, in the landscape in the Newfoundland landscape. So it became the, what they, one critic called the Newfoundland Passion. And uh, this is uh, one where uh, Christ meets his mother. Now, this woman here, uh, I, 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 these paintings are so personal. Uh, uh, I used uh, the people that were in the paintings that were close friends of mine and so on. And this woman here uh, was. Uh, Grew up with me on next to title. Her name was Ruth Brown. And she had a kind of a West Coast English face, which was very really beautiful. And uh, sort of like part of the landscape. She had a group of uh, part of the landscape. She had freckles. And, uh, and uh, so I used her there as the mother of Jesus. And there was Christ is reaching up to touch her, and she's doing the same to him. This one here was the, uh, the last fall, which was Father Adrian, who was the uh, priest at the church. This was his favorite painting. And uh, shows Christ exhausted and where there's water and it's impossible to get. So, and then it continues on. I didn't bring a lot of the uh, Mary Queen of the World because it would take up all this time and space. So I just want to show you some of the other more secular works. Oh. There's the same last window that, uh, that Brendan and I did for uh, Mary Queen of Rome Church. That's in Matthew. That's in the Matthew uh, the, uh, the, uh, building. Now I started a uh, series of uh, paintings based on uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, there's millions of paintings of Mary in the world. Uh, why would I give add another 10 or 20? But uh, I've always wanted to do it. And I've always been inspired by, by the images of, of, of Mary, particularly Mary of the Renaissance times. This was uh, uh, my favorite uh, period. Interpreting for the church at that time. The church, you know, at one time was a great sponsor of all arts and all great art. Matter of fact, the Catholic Church should be responsible for most of the great art in the world. 
and, uh, and, and they were all like commission works and so on. But the artist, you know, when I was traveling in Spain, I, I, I remember going into a, a, a small little church that was blocked with beautiful little wooden carvings and, and so on. And I, and I realized, you know, that these people that did these little tiny carvings, you could tell from the, the, the way they were carved and the sincerity of them that they actually believed in God. And they, they weren't just done for money. They were done, they were done by artists who really had great feelings about, about uh, the art and land, the landscape and, and people, especially uh, religion at that time. So when they're trying to go through these uh, uh, little because they're only what they are is just some of them are, had lettering on them, some of them are watercolors, some of them are uh, oils. Um, that's a good picture of it, but uh, it's very, I kind of like that one too. Uh, Mary, uh, a certain period in art history, just after the Renaissance. I did a black canary as well. <coughs> and there's a canary at the, at the Barons, and, uh, which is my favorite painting. And uh, you can see the Barons in the background here and so on. And she's sort of part of that, but almost ghost like in her quality. <coughs> Uh, uh, series, I met a girl, a young girl from Hollywood. Uh, she came to my studio one day and, I, and she was like 14 years old. Beautiful girl. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to try and do a couple of paintings of Mary. So I didn't have to do very much. All I did really was put a, a sort of drape uh, some cloth over her and she became Mary. Just like that. Very amazing. So I did uh, numerous times and paintings of her as well. And that's a veiled uh, version. We were talking about the veiled version the day over dinner. But this is my interpretation. This is uh, what I call ecstasy. Just look at her. White sunflower behind her. I also uh, turn to people I know and love, of course, to do drawings and paintings of them. I've done thousands of paintings, or thousands of drawings of uh, people I know and have known. And this is when I made of my wife, Theo, which I think is one of my more successful paintings. I've, I've got it inside her head on that one, I think. <laughs> but, uh, because she, she has a sense of an ancient about it that I could appreciate. But I always believe this thing too, like if you draw what's there, you'll discover what's in. So anybody who's uh, uh, an artist these days, something to keep in mind because uh, drawing is a totally different thing than trying to paint. In drawing, you only have a little point of the pen or a pencil. And you have to look, you're forced to look at things. And when you look at things, you find things that are that you never noticed them before. Like if you're doing the same drawing of the eye, you say, well, I've drawn this person before, but now that I notice there's a little crow mark there, a little crease there, age two or something. So you notice that. So you wouldn't notice that normally unless you, you, you would uh, think about it. This is one of my uh, my cousin, uh, Jane. Uh, Sal Pittman. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read one of his poems later on. Uh, but this is a lithograph I made about, uh, I think it was about maybe two years before he passed away. We were over at the college in Cornwall, and I was there to do a, a lithograph working in the shop. And I did this portrait of Val. Turned out really well. Really well. 
This is my friend Ken Watson. Uh, it's very interesting about Ken because uh, he, he was a schoolmate of mine. He was an artist, a painter, but he drifted off into other things. I think he worked at the University in Calgary. And uh, he never started painting again until he retired. And now he's at full time. But he was the first person, when I left this man, I left this man to go to Toronto in 1949, in November 1949. And I stayed out on the Danica Avenue above the shoe shop. And Ken was the first guy I met. And, uh, and then we went to, uh, we spent uh, as a, when we were kids. And then we went to high school together, we went to art school together, and then when I worked at the old Toronto Telegram, when I left, I got Ken to film my stuff. So we've been together for all those years. So it's like, I don't know, 60 years. But, uh, but he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a painter now, a full time painter. And this is Ted Walsh, you might know that. That's a lithograph as well. This is a painting I made of uh, Tom Dahl. And, uh, I was telling the story, <clears throat> but uh, when Tom and I worked on a book together called uh, Genesis again, and so his poems and my, and my paintings. And uh, I wanted to do a portrait of him for the book, so uh, as I was going up uh, to see him, uh, he said, well, let's just, i got to go down the road for a minute. And as he did, this giant, this eagle, came out of nowhere and just sort of flew over top of town. And I said, that's fantastic, you know. Like that's supposed to be luck for everybody, right? So anyway, when I was doing the painting, I was thinking about this eagle. And then I thought, no, Tom's not an eagle person. He's a crow man. <laughs> so I put me in the two crows. And sure enough, it worked. And it worked really well. Because he was pleased with it as well as I was. And, and he, he loves crows. He, he, he thinks they're the most intelligent animal on the planet. And he may be right. <laughs> uh, of, uh, this is a, a whole spiritual experience here that I had uh, when I decided to do something about shining with it. And uh, it happened this way. Quite unexpected, really. Uh, Dale and I were going out there for quite a while. And we were going out to paint there for a uh, couple of weeks. We went out on a, uh, a boat, a voyage to take this out. It was a crowd of us. And, uh, and there was a storm that came up at sea. And uh, you could see it across the water. It was a beautiful day, but you could see this storm just moving towards us. As we were going into the harbor of exploits, near a place called Grassy Island. Uh, the rain was coming down full blast and, and everybody was in the cabin to uh, get out of the rain. But I stayed out of the deck and I looked at the island as we were going by and I saw this person on the island. This uh, what I thought was a, 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 a person. And, uh, he or she, I couldn't tell what, what the sex it was, but it was he or she that had a blanket and it threw over his head and looked up into the sky like this and then let the rain come down to his face. So anyway, we landed on the exploits and uh, I had that experience. Nobody else saw it except for me. And uh, so all the time I was on exploits, I thought uh, I'd like to do something about that. Maybe I could and to go out to the island and build a little rock cairn or something in, in, in uh, honor of uh, this image, this ghost image. Uh, but nothing like that would work. So, uh, because I knew that it would be going down or felt beaten up or whatever. So then it occurred to me that I should do a bronze sculpture of Shana. And then it started to make sense. Then I thought maybe she was making herself known to me because she wanted me to do this. And it was, in fact, the first statue, the first statue marker for Shana except for the one on the south side. 
which is only just part of the old church that used to be St. Mary's Church that used to be there. And uh, so, it, so it was the first part for Shamanja. And uh, I'll just go into it here. And uh, But it was a great, uh, and they, these are drawings that I made uh, previous to the sculpture. I did a lot of those drawings. And uh, this one, I had a model, I, I found a model actually. It was an English woman, but she had very high cheekbones and she looked very magnum. And uh, that's one of the first statues I made, the very first uh, one that I saw her with the robot. And then I decided where, where she was going to go in the woods. And if you go to uh, uh, Park Hill? Boys Hill. Yeah. Boys Hill. Oh, Boys Hill, yeah. Uh, so if you go to Boys Hill, Boys Hill Park, and it's a, an interpretation center for the Beyond the Indians. And if you walk down the trail, you'll, you'll see this image. And, and that's where she, uh, that's where she, I wanted her, and it was a perfect spot for her there. There was a river running beside her, you could hear it. Dublin Brook and beautiful, uh, there's a canopy of trees like a cathedral. It's just unbelievable. And this is from here. This is the final statue. Now, I'm going to read a poem for you. Uh, when we were installing this, uh, not, not installing, but once we were uh, unveiling this statue, it was quite a day. Quite a day. My friend Al Pittman, who wrote this poem some 40 years ago, uh, and uh, it's been sitting, has just recently been published, but it was published, I think, 40 years ago, but he wrote it before that, before it was first published. This is a new publication here. It's a collection of uh, Al Pittman's poems called An Island in the Sky. You can, you can get it at all with bookshops. So I just want to read this because what he did, like there was a lot of people who were not sure about what Shanda meant or so on, they're all new to it. Okay. Uh, but he, he put a uh, he put a, uh, a a mood over the people that were there that uh, made the day and made the, my sculpture uh, feel worthwhile. So I'd, I'd like to read this for you. It's called Shanda. What I know of you is only what my great seven history book told me. That you were young when they caught you. That your people lived in nearby houses. That they changed your name to Nancy. That you died soon after. That you were the last of the Yankees. You probably didn't know that, did you? That you were the last of your people. That when you went, there was no one to take your place. I suppose you died thinking there were uncles and cousins with toothaches and babies, that there were hunters, young men you'd like to be with, coming home, getting laid with campfires on the shores of the lake, your executioners all ready. You didn't know you'd end up in my great seven history book, did you? And when you died, you were only death. When the white disease put an end to you, you didn't know that of all those years beyond your decay, I would long to be with you, to tell you I wouldn't forget. You didn't know that I would have kissed you and cried when you went. Of course, that has nothing at all to do with my own images of you, and they are too much mixed up with technicolor movies and my own boyish music. I see you as beautiful as Deborah Patchett, who played the role of an Indian girl in a movie I barely remember. I can't see you, no matter how hard I try, mud caked and offensive smelling. I can't see you groaning and twisting on the floor of your smoky manatee, locked in any embrace with your rough, raw, old cousins. I see you, and I know this is all wrong. 
I see you leaning over a blue pool, the sun filtering through the office, that sends blue shivers of light bouncing off your golden eye. And your beautiful embroidered dress parts to let you bend. Your reflection looks up to me from the still water, and your eyes are two holes deeper than any this brook could fill. The eyes of a martyr, of one who waits patiently for death, knowing that beyond all kindred deaths, yours will matter most. Yet in all this, there is a sentence about you, for you have not always consented to your martyrdom. Before this, before it had all been revealed to you through witchcraft and religion, you had wished rather that I would walk buckskin into your course and take you upstream to a place the shaman and the gods had ordained for us. And there, in an eternity of summers, we would have loved each other gently in the brook crude summers. That dream, of course, though it pleases me that you have it, was entirely impossible. For you had to die as you did. You had to be the last of your people before I could love you at all. I admit now, putting this poem aside, that my love for you has nothing to do with you. Not as you were or might have been in those few of your own dead end days. For in those days, surely my affection would have been given over to some Newfoundland mask with fair hair and delicate English skin. There might have been times then when I would have impressed her with stories of how I raised your village, killed your own cousin, and laughed heartily all the way home. The workman who destroyed your grave to build his portion of road did not know what he was doing, did not know that I would have knelt in awe at that spot, love, spot loving you and condemning your death all in one prayer. He did not know. He ruined forever my one chance to come close to you. And therefore, what is he guilty of but depriving me of one singular and pitiful indulgence? One moment in my history when I could have knelt over your fleshless remains and said, Janet, I love you. What did he do? but save you the agony of one more lie. So that poem really got me interested, really influenced a lot. Technician? Okay. So that's the uh, so that's the continuation. Now this is a this is a tradition I got from the uh, from the uh, from uh, Pedro St. John's, and uh, was uh, celebrating the life of, uh, of uh, Father Patrick Mapper, who was a uh, uh, bishop here in Newfoundland <coughs> in the 1754, I think it was, he said. Now, uh, me? No, no, I don't think you can. Uh, I don't think you can straighten it up anymore. It's gonna be blurrier. Around here, so, um, uh, 
I use the uh, cross, which I will show you here now. Uh, this one here. Uh, this is uh, ceramic, by the way. It's not metal, but it's ceramic. And uh, center, you can see John the Baptist himself there. And then the stigmatis of, uh, of St. Francis. Uh, all of the bishops in Newfoundland are all from the Francis order. So uh, St. Francis would be, would be Christ would be their arm. Francis with the uh, robe, robe there, and there's the, the, the uh, man, and then there's the fish representing it. So all those symbols are all part of the, the uh, cathedral. I did a lot of research on how this is. A, this is a, so. Now these, I, uh, I also do a lot of sort of portraits of uh, so uh, I'll just go through these. These are posthumous portraits. This I call uh, people. This is Virginia Woolf, by the way. And uh, I like her writings. And I like everything about her. I love her mythology as well. As her, uh, she, she had a photograph taken of her when she was there. She was about 15 years old. She was absolutely striking. It's a whole series of drawings and paintings based on that. And uh, so you'll see he says a strong button again. He was a hand to hold by him. He was the court leader to Henry VIII. And uh, I like his work. It, 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 not his paintings as much as I, I like his drawings. His beautiful drawings. Gwen John. Uh, Gwen uh, was the sister of Augustus John. Uh, some of you would remember Augustus John. In the 1940s, Augustus John was probably the most famous English painter alive at the time. That uh, Picasso had said was the best and the worst. <laughs> but, uh, his, his sister, which is Gwen, uh, was a fabulous painter. And she lived a very quiet life talking about sacred spaces. She lived in, mostly in a small room in Paris. And uh, she painted women that she knew, and uh, chairs and window cells and things of that sort. And Augustus John said to himself, he says, someday uh, I'll be remembered as her brother. But that was very nice. Nietzsche. Yours truly. I did a whole bunch of, I do, there's another area where I go to take a look at uh, myself in the mirror every once in a while. I can bear it. But uh, you look for stuff that's in there, and, uh, and each time you look, it's different. It's like looking at the ocean. Every time you look at the ocean, the ocean is different, never the same. And if, you, if you're conscious of or sensitive enough to your own, Things, you'll realize that each time you look in the mirror, it's a different face. That's a grumpy me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, I don't know what <laughs> And this is snobby me. <coughs> snobby. And this is mad me. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> Now, uh, I want to get into the landscape because uh, the landscape, there is no separation between the landscape and the spirit, as everybody knows. When you're, when you're in, God made the universe be, for us to, to live in and, uh, and admire and, and uh, respect. Getting very little these days, but uh, when it's supposed to, be our spot, our, our special head of the landscape. And there's so much there, and there's so much that passes people by without, uh, without their knowing. This one I call uh, Big Blue. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rabbit that's upon the Little State Arabs. Big Blue. And uh, this is a you might have seen this painting. Uh, it's in the airport. 
in St. John's. And uh, it's on that back wall underneath where all the cards are. And it's a 10 feet, 10 feet by 6 feet. It's a large painting. And it's about the caribou on the barrens. And I got my inspiration from the area around St. Shops in the box. So, and you can see that most people see caribou, you see them off in the distance. I'm sure sometimes whether it's a rock you're looking at or a caribou. So I did it that way. So uh, I think I might have some details in it. Now, this one uh, is a drawing. Sometimes I'll make a, a, a drawing first and then a painting. And sometimes I'll make a painting and a drawing. So, but I, I, I consider, excuse me, I consider the, uh, the drawing of the work of art as well. It's not just a, a preliminary study, it's a work of art. So, I, uh, so this is the drawing that I made. So I added the crows and that song up there. Created kind of a wind. And this is what I call uprooted. And, uh, you'd see that. Uh, I'm sure it's been around quite a lot. Quite a lot. This one of uh, Signal Hill. Uh, looking in from out at the lighthouse here. The back here. And uh, deliberately made the, 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 the tower a little smaller than it really is. It sets to that massive uh, bone like shape there. Yes, so it's a painting I call uh, uh, Interruption or Interference. The reason for it, when I was painting this, it was so quiet, everything was so beautiful. I've been in the, in the woods sometimes when they're not a sound, just a little bit of breeze or a few birds or something. And then uh, when I was there, I heard the rattle of a chainsaw. And it changed, it changed the landscape in my mind. So I, what I did is I put this little figure here, figure in there just to give that uh, sense that there's a disturbance happening here. Do I put it off or not? I don't know. <coughs> this is where uh, Genesis is getting. This is quite a large painting, triptych. And it was on the cover of uh, the book that I, that I did with Tom, Tom Dahl, where Genesis begins. Parents painting. I love painting out in the same parents. It's just incredible. I've done a lot of work out there. And this is a painting I first saw as a child, actually, on Xbox, where the, you know, there was a big boulder not too far from where we did. And the horses would gather there during the storm when I was a boy. And when I was out painting, George and I, actually, George and Brad, were painting in the bottom of the, the cave. And exactly the same thing happened in the cave. So I made this painting. It's quite a big painting. But since the horses gathered, they put their backs to the, to the wind. It's very really beautiful to watch and smell. <laughs> Light on the barrens. Early morning mist on the roots are above the ground. They're very beast. It's a very it's a big beast too. Three pounds. This is the lighthouse in Ontario where we live. This is my first painting I made of the lighthouse, actually. Uh, I know where the original is, but uh, that's kind of a dark image of her. Uh, it's not really that dark. This is another uh, shot of the lighthouse. You can see it from across the way. The cheese hole is just below the lighthouse there. This is the Hare's Ears pilot, which was right off the tip of the lighthouse itself. And I did a lot of paintings of that pilot, uh, just sort of very attractive to it. I still do it every time I walk in. This is the southern end of uh, 
of Harris Harris. And that's the northern end. These are the rocks from the lighthouse. Yep. Oh, you're not, you're not here. Yeah. Oh, oh, I've been talking to myself. <laughs> I didn't know you knew that. I had a little cat there. <laughs> that's what it is. Oh. That one has been around for a long time, too. And that, that's one I saw up in, uh, in a river in uh, Central America. And the sun was right behind the rock itself and throwing a shadow. And I noticed where the shadow is, you could see underneath the water. But where the light is, you can't see. So the light is blind in a sense. Sometimes you need the light in the dark to make things work properly. Especially in pain, light and dark is so important. Uh, they often said about Rembrandt that uh, whether he made his paintings dark to expose the light, or did he use the light to expose the dark? We don't know for sure. I don't think he was ever asked that question. And uh, there it is. And it's certainly think about it. Put the state islands. Oh, the one I wanted to show you before. There. <coughs> These are the birch trees right outside my house in Hollywood. And uh, as I said sometimes I'll make a, a, a drawing person. I did a drawing first. And uh, a lot of detail in that. If you, were, if you saw the original, you don't see too much there. But this was the baby I made. So I toned everything down in the back and made it almost like it's just in the evening time. With a green sky. And it works there too. You don't see green skies. <laughs> this one here too is this. I love this thing. You see a lot of that uh, in the woods near the rivers where the trees are dying, lack of water and stuff. Beautiful. Nothing more beautiful than a dying tree. Mm -hmm. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, everybody back there? Yes. Uh, this one here is a Harbor Maine. Uh, I went out, I saw this rock, it was balancing the rock. And while I was working on it, I realized that it's not balancing, it's dancing. So it's a dancing rock. You can see from the sky and the rest of it. It was really cartoonish. It's a dancing rock. <clears throat> this is an old church down in uh, St. Karen. Day. And I went there, uh, I spent five days up in Ascension Bay, and I went up particularly to paint this church. And it's, uh, it's the last of the really old church that I call the last house of the bay, is the house of God. But the most beautiful thing, you know, it, it had a copper roof that was holding the building together, and, but it's slowly falling apart and so on and so forth. The iron foreground was the, was the bell tower, and they used to ring that bell, and you could hear the whole of the conception day. And the, the people would come, and their boats would come in on the beach. So I spent the whole day there, but I noticed something very, very beautiful that was happening. Although the church was decaying, the flowers were growing, and there were millions of them everywhere. So it was exciting. This is one I did uh, during the winter uh, at the Witness Bay Barrens. Close up the watercolor, close up of uh, twigs and trees and stumps. This is uh, what I call light, light in the forest. Just yeah, to I think you'll see this a lot. People don't notice these things very much. Uh, a few little stumps or a twig or something like that. Give you a beautiful painting. Do me that, here. 
This one here, uh, that's the Kent Cottage up there. Uh, our gardens and residents at the Kent Cottage. Twice, actually. And while I was up there, I went up there early in the, in the spring. It was cold up there. I had to get that fire going and keep it warm and fun. As I was walking by, there's a stone wall there. And if I looked down into the garden, there's an old uh, wild rose bush that had that was dying, and obviously it, looked, it was dying to me. And, but I could see a few little uh, leaves very important itself on the top that lived. I walked by every day and I took a look at it. And finally, there was this one little rose, <laughs> little tiny rose, which was right in here. And uh, that was so beautiful. Uh, it, it, it was beautiful enough to the man painting that face. Uh, this was also done at Kent Cottage. Uh, if you've been up to Kent Cottage, I'm sure some of you have. Uh, when you walk out the door of the cottage, you look to your, you're walking up to your left, you'll see a, a, a pear tree, an old pear tree, that produces rather good pears, actually. And one morning I woke up, there were no pears, there was just a bear in the tree at the time. But the fog was just coming in from the, from the ocean. And the pear tree just seemed to be sitting there in the midst of all this fog. So beautiful. So I just added a little bit of texture of the, uh, of the hillsides in Brigus, which is really quite extraordinary. And uh, did a painting. There's a Kent Cottage in the water park. <coughs> Last but not least is uh, my love for domestic animals. <laughs> I, uh, I love to go to uh, Casey Perry's where the sheep are. And I go to see the sheep, what people go to see the, the birds. <laughs> I have a sheep there that's, uh, that I call Nan, or Nan. And I've done, I've done two or three paintings of her. And she's a beautiful show coming out. And uh, I, uh, there she is with her, with her young uh, man, old man and man. And she got the scars, and you can see it. She had her ear cut right in here. Right up here, there's a piece cut right out of her ear. And the same on the other side. So you can recognize her when she comes up to see her. There she is there. And, uh, but you wonder, you know, when you look at them, what are, what are they looking at? What do they see? What do they see? This is uh, Cliff George's goat. Some people know Cliff George. And uh, Sonny, I think it was called Sonny, wasn't it? Yeah, he was. And uh, I was up there to visit Cliff one day. And then a painting of his goat. Man, I saw up there. Keeps it nervous. This is the last one. And this is a, a new turn in the entry. Uh, well, it's called a mission. And uh, I was in a, I was, at the Washington Art Gallery in Washington, D.C., uh, the National Gallery there, and wandering through it, I saw this little ceramic sculpture in a glass cage of a, of a bishop, made probably in the 16th century, maybe even earlier. It had such an effect on me that I, 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 I tried to do, do a painting. Um, but as this was happening, Quite interesting. As I was painting, uh, it ended up that the hair hair becomes like a crown of thorns. Blood happened while I was working on the painting, and I was working on this area here. Some of the red paint sort of ran down over the head. And I thought that that's uh, that's uh, work from God himself. My left it there. And so you've, you've got this person now that is 
that is it. In, in, in any church, uh, any church, or the Catholic church, or the church of England, or whatever, you have people who donate their lives or give their lives totally to God and to the upkeep of churches and try to maintain the Christian religion. It's a heavy burden for an ordinary human being to do. And uh, that's basically what this painting means to me. Just copy 
photograph, which is not, well, not, I don't agree with. How many paintings do you figure you In my lifetime? Yeah. Oh, thousands. Uh, yeah, thousands. Yeah, could be thousands. And, uh, anybody else? How long were you? How young? When I started? When you were first interested. Well, so somebody uh, was on exploits a uh, uh, while back and found a sketchbook of mine when I was seven. Oh, okay. And he would give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so but I do have a reproduction, and I made a reproduction of it. And uh, so that was, I was drawing it even then. But uh, when I moved to Toronto, and uh, I, I moved, actually moved to Toronto in 1949, uh, November 1949, my mother moved there as an army officer, and uh, we followed, of course, and, uh, uh, you know, that's it. But that's uh, when I started, when I seriously took it serious. When I, when I discovered that I could do something with painting that I couldn't do with any other medium. Uh, it became a lifetime obsession with me. An obsession it is. Well, I had thought, you know, I did, I did teach, yeah. No, I was known as a kid that could draw. <laughs> kid that could draw. <laughs> <laughs> I remember once, uh, uh, well, I didn't know we were there, but we were down at your place, actually, at Clive's place, and uh, there was a man uh, cleaning the garden or fixing up the garden or something, and Clyde introduced him to me, and uh, he said, ah, he says, you're the young fellow that sketched our lard. <laughs> Spirits, Jerry, and then when you started talking about Cape St. Mary's, I said that clinched us. <laughs> Cape St. Mary's is right next door to that beautiful little place called Brad. <laughs> I'd just like to acknowledge the centerfold of the uh, program that you have, and to go back, uh, Jerry, where it all started uh, between you and Bill McLeckler, and that's when you saw a picture of Our Lady of Newfoundland. And tonight we're honored that the grandson of the lady who commissioned this picture is with us. So Peter Duff, please stand up. It was Peter's grandmother who commissioned uh, this picture in memory of her late husband, uh, Edward Duff. And so we're delighted uh, that Peter is here. And I believe that to this very day, uh, there is a Duff in the uh, church in Quidivity, um, so which is very interesting. I'd like to read uh, what's on the centerfold and it's above the picture of Our Lady of Newfoundland because it certainly epitomizes, uh, Jerry, what you have brought home to us tonight. And it's not by accident, I think it's by providence, uh, that we put this particular uh, quote in the brochure that you have. Art has the capacity to stir deep emotions. But these emotions don't arise unless a little effort is put forth. Have you ever considered that you can have a relationship with art? Understanding the distinction between seeing and experiencing is the first step in appreciating art. But that deeper step of relationship with the work may be a step many of us skip. We lose out on the emotional power of art when we rush our way through instead of savoring and even praying with art. 
Well done, Jerry Squires. It's an honor for us to have you here on sacred ground. Welcome. <laughs> 